Okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, Software-defined networking in Apache Cloud Stack. Um, some of you might have seen me yesterday, but uh, as a reintroduction. My name is Chirudeep. I work for uh, Citrix, and I'm a committer at the Apache Cloud Stack project. And that's my Twitter handle in case you want to hear my occasional thoughts. I'm going to be talking about uh, what is Cloud Stack and uh, what is IES. So, uh, for those of you who are already familiar with it, so bear with me there. Uh, what is software-defined networking, and what is why does why did the two of the, the two mix together? Why is SDN and IES a good fit? Now, I'll, I'll talk about how Cloud Stack's network model enables you to. Um, enables you to uh, add more or different kinds of SDN into Cloud Stack. And, uh, and then we describe some of the integrations already done in Cloud Stack. Finally, we talk about uh, Cloud Stack's native SDN controller and how that works and some of the features for uh, Cloud Stack and SDN. Um, uh, Apache Cloud Stack, for those, those of you not familiar, it's been in the Apache Foundation since uh, April last year. It was open source before then. And uh, what sets it apart usually is that it's, you know, it's mature, it's got tons of deployment, and usually it's complete. You really don't need much else to get started with Cloud Stack. So this is how, uh, you know, Amazon is the, is the cloud, you know, which everybody tries to follow. And if you look at how Amazon tried to build a cloud, they start with some servers, some storage, and some networking, usually commodity, or we guess it's commodity. Uh, then they use open source Zen hypervisor to kind of stitch everything together. And then they have their orchestration software, which uh, helps them manage uh, uh, the, the, the physical resources, the networking, the, the hypervisor, uh, and, the, and the storage. And then they give you this very nice API on top of it, which enables anybody, uh, you and I, to go off and create uh, powerful topologies, huge deployments. Um, at, the, at the click of a button, right? And then there's the e-commerce platform which uh, vends that service to you. You know, charges, you mix, you know, gives you bills, it sends you, um, lets you use your credit card, and so on and so forth. So how can you build your cloud? You start with pretty much the same thing, but you don't have to do absolute commodity servers, networking, and storage. You, uh, you can use any hypervisor you want, KVM or Zen or uh, VMware. And this is where CloudStack comes in, where, our orchestra where CloudStack's orchestration software can uh, manage all these elements in the data center for you. And then you can use it and you can manage it, this uh, virtual infrastructure, uh, with either the CloudStack API or the Amazon API. And usually uh, people who deploy CloudStack and want to sell it to other, uh, other customers, like you know, public cloud providers, they build an optional portal which lets them sell these services uh, to the end user. So that's, that's what uh, a cloud stack cloud roughly looks like. And so what about SDN? SDN, um, fundamentally, it's a, it's a separation of the control plane which performs the, the, the forwarding of the packets and the, uh, and, and the actual the, the function that decides where the packet needs to go and the function that's actually doing the forwarding is separated into, into distinct layers. And usually this means that the control plane is logically centralized. Um, if you look at the current internet inf uh, routing infrastructure instance, that it, con it consists of a bunch of routers talking to each other with routing protocols. There is no central person or entity anywhere saying that if I send a packet from uh, Portland, uh, this hotel in Portland to google.com, that it should take this route. That kind of is an emergent property of the internet. So there's no central place which decides how these routes are kind of calculated. SDN tries to turn this on its head and saying that, yeah, for some applications, you need this kind of centralized control. And some of the advantages are is that you know once you have the central control, now it's easier for you to troubleshoot and maintain and, and set up your network. 
because uh, if, I, if I'm failing to set up, send my packet from uh, here to Google uh, data center in, in uh, let's say, London, how do you figure out what's going on, right? And so having a central point of control is probably an easier way to go. And the second part is that if you look at traditional uh, data set, the state of data center networking today or any networking today, usually you have to telnet into the box and run a bunch of isotery commands and which only you, 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 very few people know. And it really doesn't translate into anything like, oh, I want to set up a flow of package from here to there. Right, so, so this box mode of configuration where you're logging into each box and trying to configure it is, is hard to do and it's error prone because it doesn't directly translate into exactly what you're trying to do, which is to set up a flow from point A to point B. And then uh, related to SDN, you might hear that, you know, uh, well, you know, you know so company X might claim I got a, uh, an SDN, we already do SDN. And so it turns out to be uh, an API layer or a collection of boxes. And typically that doesn't uh, give you the full functionality of, of SDN. And then people also talk about OpenFlow. But OpenFlow is just a part of SDN, or it's just one way to do SDN. And it's just a standard protocol for talking between the control plane and the forwarding plane. And then you also talk, find people talking about, oh, well, this overlay is better than that overlay, or I'm going to use this tunnel mechanism to implement my SDN. And it's, it's, part, it's part, very much part of SDN because um, these overlays are very flexible and, and they help you to set up these paths I was talking about. And typically, a lot of the initial SDN implementations do use overlays. So uh, to put it into, into picture, so you've got these uh, bunch of uh, machines that need to uh, communicate with each other. And they're, and they're, and they're you know, interconnected with a bunch of boxes, uh, routers, switches, forwarding elements, what have you. Right? So here comes in the SDN controller. It's usually a, um, a, a cluster of uh, compute servers uh, uh, connect, and they usually have a MySQL, uh, uh, a relational database or a scalable NoSQL database backing their uh, implementation. And they also ha have an API in, in front of them. And then they can talk to these, uh, bidirectionally to these forwarding elements using their own proprietary protocols, or here's where OpenFlow comes in, or you know, you can even talk SSH. But the bottom line is that the, the control is being done at the top, and the forwarding is being done at the bottom there. And so now, when the end user says, you know, set up a flow uh, from this box to that box, uh, the SDN controller can decide to set it up that way. And then when the second flow is desired to a different box, now it can take an entirely different route, even though the, the beginning box and the end box are the same, right? So this is the power that SDN gives you. So, well, uh, how is this congruent with the IAS? And I'm gonna go quickly through this because I guess most of you have used the cloud. So um, this is all from uh, Wikipedia. So cloud is defined by agility. That means you know you got a complex you know infrastructure. You want to change it. It's it's a matter of minutes, not days. Uh, there's an API, which means that you can do a lot of automation. It usually means virtualization, which means that you know you can move your workload from place to place. And then if you have a very powerful machine, you can ch chop it up into small chunks. Uh, Multi-tenancy is also very important in the cloud because you're sharing these resources with other tenants who you may or may not trust. Scalability is, is one of the defining features. I mean, if you look at uh, in a cloud like Amazon, any time you make an API request to deploy a VM, you're practically guaranteed to start up the VM. It's like it has infinite capacity. So you want to give that, uh, that illusion of infinite capacity. And then there's elasticity. So if you're not using any of the, uh, the virtual machines you've started up, you can kill them and get, stop getting charged for them. And it's self-service, so there's, you're not calling the IT department to, to, ask you, to ask them to give you a server, to provision a path or anything, it's all through the API. So how does it translate into uh, uh, networking for the cloud, right? So it means that 
non-network engineers are creating complex network topologies in, in, inside a cloud. And, and they need an API to, in order to do this. And, 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 and whatever solution we use for cloud networking has to work with virtualization because it's gonna be involved not only programming uh, hardware switches but also the hypervisor level switches. And then it needs to scale, which means that um, if you use a solution like uh, VLANs, which in, we all know has a maximum of 4,000 VLANs, um, it usually, you know, that's a very uh, strong limiting factor that you want to avoid. And then elasticity. So if you, if somebody creates a load balancer today and then destroys it tomorrow, um, you know, you need to be able to take that load balancer out of service and not pay for it anymore. And it's self-service, and these are real novices. I mean, you can't expect them to debug what, ha what went wrong. So if, if, if they provision something and a packet doesn't go from A to B, you need to be able to tell them why it's not going from A to B and give them a solution or a workaround or tell them what they did wrong, right? And so you can see that you know, uh, the, these two are made for each other. So the SDN API uh, gives you this agility to make really easy and quick changes to the network and, and then as these SDN products are usually made to work with uh, you know, hypervisors and, and virtualization. And the, the design goal for out of the box for all these SDN controllers is for extreme large scale. And it enables virtual networking and by virtual networking I mean this illusion of isolated networks on top of shared physical infrastructure. So you know, uh, Dave and, and Joe might have uh, networks in the same cloud, they don't trust each other, but uh, they, they, they believe they have the, the illusion of isolation in that cloud. And, and this is where actually the, uh, the issue of what overlay to use, and uh, I'm not gonna go too much into this, but depending on how you solve this problem of, well, I have a virtual machine with this virtual address, how do I map it to the physical location where I want to send this packet to? Uh, that tends out to, turns out to be the main difference between any of these overlay technologies where, you know, with VXLAN, the hypervisor sends a multicast with GRE, um, it's pre-programmed by the control plane, and then if you use a technology called uh, security groups, uh, there, it turns out you don't need any mapping or discovery for that. I'm going to skip through this. So, so what does a virtual network look like in an IAS cloud? And I don't know why this is happening. Ah, so you have a uh, you know uh, you've deployed your network, and let's say you have these uh, four blue VMs running in there. And it looks like a regular old network, right? It's uh, it's running in the cloud, but then it's you got these uh, uh, private IP addresses. 10.1.1.2 uh, to all the way to 10.1.1.5. And then they, they have a gateway, uh, which is 10.1.1.1 to go out of the internet. And, and this edge device, which gives them access to the internet, can do uh, things like NAT and DHCP and, and load balancing and VPN and so on and so forth. And, and then, you know, uh, oops. Tenant, uh, the second tenant comes in and, and creates a very similar topology, and then he, but he can choose a different set of services. And you can notice that the set of IP addresses that he gets is exactly the same as the other tenant. So that's the illusion of isolation that virtual networking gives you. So uh, CloudStack's network model helps you, you know, map this virtual network concept onto the physical infrastructure. So uh, this is the physical infrastructure which is overlaid on top of that uh, virtual infrastructure. And so what it lets you do is that it map, lets you map virtual networks to physical infrastructure. It lets you define and provision uh, network services like load balancing and VPN. And then it lets you, uh, helps you manage the elasticity and scale that you need for cloud networking.
So, so I talked about uh, network services, and let me explain what that is. Um, if you look at this, uh, the slide here, you have these uh, two guys, uh, Dave and Joe. Dave's got a set of services. It's got NAT, DHCP, uh, firewalling, and load balancing. But Joe's got only VPN, NAT, and DHCP. So each tenant or each network in the cloud tends to have a different set of net, uh, service requirements, right? And so we need to be able to provide that differentiation for each network. So if you look at the long list of services that people are used to in a, in a data center, uh, the first thing is they want L2 connectivity, that they want you know, uh, your IP address space like in, at your home where each, uh, each of your uh, virtual machines is in the same L2 domain. Then they want to be able to address, assign addresses to it and then look it up by uh, DNS name and then route it to the in, uh, external internet. And then maybe you want to be able to uh, provide uh, access control between the uh, between the machines. Uh, you want to be able to firewall off the uh, the internet, and you want to give NAT so that you know your even though you don't have a public IP address, you can still access public IP services. Uh, you want VPN to connect you know uh, data centers together. You want load balancing to provide a scalable web service. And you, you might even need things like intrusion detection and, and intrusion uh, prevention in, in the cloud. And, and the state of the market today is that you can do this with a number of different ways. Uh, you can use uh, hardware firewalls, which you know uh, companies like Cisco and, and Juniper will gladly sell you. You can use uh, appliances, which are virtual appliances, to, to do the same thing. Some of these tasks you can delegate to the hypervisor, and some of these tasks there will be, you know, what they're called virtual routing functions inside the hardware, which can provide that kind of isolation. And then, depending on the isolation technology you have chosen to isolate your tenants, uh, you can do this in in many different ways. You can uh, sometimes the cloud is deployed with no isolation. Sometimes it has VLAN isolation and sometimes it has overlay isolation, or maybe a mix of these things. And so you want to be able to do network services with a bunch of different service providers on a, diff a bunch of different types of network topologies. And so that's primarily the, the challenge which the cloud stack networking model is trying to do. And, and when it comes to SDN controls, the state of the art tends to be that the uh, SDN controllers can provide um, these kind of services, but typically not these. And they typically work with VLAN isolation and, 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 uh, and overlays. Any questions so far? So how does CloudStack you know, give you that kind of flexibility? So CloudStack has a service catalog, and if you run a virtual machine in any cloud, it typically asks you, well, what size of VM do you want? Do you want it small, and do you want it, you know, extra memory with it? Uh, you know, and so that's, that's uh, like a service catalog of CPU and memory offerings. And so CloudStack takes a similar approach to, uh, to the network part of uh, designing the network. So the, the end user is not exposed to the nature. He doesn't know that his firewalling is being provided by a Cisco device and, his, um, and that, that his uh, load balance is being provided by a Netscaler or, or any of those combinations, right? All he wants is the, the abstract service offered to him. <coughs> so the cloud operator would design the service using CloudStacks APIs and then offers them to end users. So let's see what that looks like. So let's say he's got a service called Gold, and then he tells CloudStack, you know, to provide the Gold level of service, uh, you just use uh, virtual appliances, which are cheap and you know doesn't don't cost me anything in, in license terms, and but they don't give you that much throughput either. So it, it offers you load balancing and firewalling using virtual appliances, or then he designs a platinum offering where you get these two services plus the VPN, but they're all using hardware appliances, so it gives you that 
level of performance, but then you charge extra for that too. And then you can mix and match. So you can even say, well, I want to re restrict the, the rate to 10 megabits per second, and then use virtual appliances as well. So, and then charge even less for that. So, so here's an example of, uh, of how this is realized. So um, this is the, the, the old uh, virtual topology I showed you, where you have these uh, contiguous IP addresses and you got your four VMs. And out of the box, CloudStack gives you this virtual appliance called the, the CloudStack Virtual Router, which can give you a whole bunch of different network services, anywhere from DHCP to uh, load balancing to VPN. And so let's say this is the gold offering, very cheap. Um, it gives you an access to a few public IP addresses and, and all these services, right? And, and assuming that the service provider has chosen VLAN isolation, uh, the CloudStack picks a free VLAN out of the uh, pool of VLANs and then allocates that uh, to that customer. Or maybe this is the, the platinum offering where you get the same set of services. You got the DHCP and load balancing and VPN and NAT all the way, but the, the, the service offering is realized using uh, the Juniper SRX firewall and the NetScaler load balancer, right? And at, at the bottom there, you see that this, the CloudStack virtual router is still there, but all it's doing is DHCP and DNS, right? And so, so quick. Pardon me? It's also interacting with the Nescaler load balancer and with the router, right? It's, sorry, quick. So it's the virtual router, it's also interacting with the hardware. The no, browser. no, all it's doing is making sure that the VMs get their DHCP addresses, that's it. Yeah, so it's, it, in that function, it's not a virtual router, but it is the same software image as that what we're using here, that's all, yeah. So, so this is the, 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 the magic orchestration that CloudStack does for you, right? And then uh, and if, and if you're a savvy uh, service provider, you want to hook your customers in with the cheap offering and then let them upgrade to the, uh, to the expensive offering once their service becomes successful. And then you can offer them an upgrade path from uh, each one, one type of service offering to another type of service offering. So that's something like you have an M1 small in your Amazon cloud, and it's, it's doing fine. Suddenly you have been uh, uh, digged or whatever, and then you, know, you suddenly need bigger capacity, so you upgrade to the uh, M1 extra, extra large uh, to serve that extra capacity. And, 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 it, and it's all just an API call to do that. And the important thing to note here is that the, the user calling, the, making the API call has no idea what he's using, whether it's the CS virtual router or whether it's the, uh, the, the, the hardware uh, load balancer and the, the Juniper firewall. So that kind of complexity, that box level configuration is hidden from the end user. And you could argue that this is also an SDN, but um, it kind of doesn't fit that uh, current definition right now, but it is a, a large-scale orchestration of uh, service appliances. And then you could do even something like uh, multi-tier, so you want to have your traditional web tier, app tier, database tier, uh, and then CloudStack will help you orchestrate that as well. So you start up your web tier, some VMs there, some um, app tier, and your database tier, and now you can start defining um, access control rules saying that um, the app tier or the, the web tier can't access the database tier, but the app tier can access the database tier. And then you can uh, provision uh, load balancers on the web tier, uh, hook them up to uh, other data center services like MPLS, and even create an IPsec site-to-site uh, -site VPN uh, using uh, sort of using IPsec uh, to their uh, remote premises. So this is like a complete uh, network solution in the cloud, uh, which gives you the functional equivalence of something like Amazon VPC. Uh, 
And uh, that, that's the list of services that uh, this single appliance uh, gives you. It gives you uh, DHCP, DNS, load balancing, site-to-site -side VPN, static routes, um, access controls, and add port forwarding, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I've been talking a lot about orchestration, and so let me define what that means. And this is the definition from Wikipedia, but essentially what you're doing is we're taking complex computer systems, whether they're uh, network devices or hypervisors or other services, and in a step-by-step -step fashion, we are orchestrating them in order to provide that, end, that service which the end user requires, right? And so, if you look here, literally, when you create an Amazon VPC in CloudStack, we go off and start this virtual appliance. We, we allocate this VLAN for you, carve it out. We, uh, we interact with the hypervisors to place these v, uh, VMs, NICs on, those, on, the, on that VLAN. Uh, we write uh, rules into the uh, virtual appliance to make sure that the access control rules are satisfied. We do, uh, we install static routes into the virtual appliance so that you can access the internet. We will talk to the, uh, the hardware load balancer or the virtual load balancer, spin it up, spin it down. Um, Put these, uh, make, make sure these uh, NICs are all uh, hooked up together properly, and even you know control or uh, control the uh, IPsec software in order to make sure that the, uh, the the VPN works. So that that's you know at the heart of what CloudStack does is orchestration. So naturally, uh, CloudStack has this orchestration core which handles a great deal of this orchestration. And in front of that orchestration core, sorry, and, and because CloudStack has all this flexibility in, in talking to a number of different hypervisors, talking to a number of different network appliances, uh, there is this plugin framework which helps us to abstract this complexity. And the plugins are broadly hypervisor network, um, allocator, and, and storage. Uh, the reason I put the storage in in dotted lines is because that's just new. It's just landed in, in trunk a couple of days ago. So, so to uh, to handle uh, the differences between Zen Server, VMware, uh, KVM, and Oracle, uh, there's plugins for each of them. For uh, if you wanted to do something fancy in the way you place your VMs on different hypervisors, there's different algorithms for that. And uh, if you wanted to do, use different uh, kinds of SDN controllers, you could write different plugins for that. And so how does that work? So here's, here comes the user. Uh, there's a bunch of API servers in front of the orchestration core. User says, give me a VM, right? And that, that gets passed on to the orchestration core. And at this point, uh, the service that's responsible for starting up the VM asks the allocator, you know, which hypervisor should I land this VM on, right? And so once that is chosen, it goes to the hypervisor plugin and says, you know, I need to start this VM or create this VM. And so that, so that message goes off to the actual hypervisor to actually start the VM. And then you go to the network resource to the plugin saying that, you know, I need to place this VM's NIC on this network. And same with the storage, that you want to tell the storage in a carve out the volume for this, copy this template from, uh, from here into that volume, and so that the VM can start. And although I've shown this as a serial step, you can actually imagine this you know, as, a, as a set of parallel instructions that you, know, you could um, tell the network plugin and the storage plugin to work in parallel, for example. So, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that this is a set of orchestration steps uh, with well-defined semantics. Uh, you could fail at any of these uh, steps, and then CloudStack would still ensure that you have a consistent view of the system, right? If you uh, created the VM, created the network, but you failed at the storage step, 
Cloud Stack will roll, roll, roll that all back for you and make sure there's no uh, resources left around uh, which are half-baked, half right? Which is what any orchestration system should do. So where does, uh, how does Cloud Stack integrate with uh, software-defined networking controllers? So that comes in at the network plugin stage where um, uh, the, uh, the, the software-defined controller, software-defined networking controller uh, is, is uh, th there is a glue which is written in the plugin which glues CloudStack's networking model into the SDN's networking model. So uh, what we have today is uh, integration with uh, with, with sorry with uh, NiceSera NVP and they use uh, something called STT isolation, and that's available in, in 4.0, and then the, they are contributing SourceNet and, and the logical router in, in 4.2. Um, Big Switch has made a contribution. Their VLAN isolation is there in 4.1, and uh, their VNS isolation should be there in 4.2. Midokura is working on uh, the L2 to L4 network virtualization, which should be in, the, in, in 4.2. And then there's uh, some the built-in SDN controller in CloudStack. Um, I'm going to call it the CloudStack native controller or the built-in controller. And it's been there for almost a year now, yeah, but it requires Zen server. So, um, so let's see how that, that can work. Um, so let's say the, uh, the end user says, you know, give me three VMs. It's, today is three API calls. Um, we allocate the hypervisors for those uh, VMs, and then we shoot out these laser beams. Sorry, make these API calls. <laughs> um, laser beams are coming in six startup. Okay. <laughs> um, to start up these VMs, right? And so here you have. Um, these uh, three VMs require that virtual router to be started up, so that you start up first, and then uh, these three VMs uh, come in here. And uh, so how does the, uh, the native controller work? So it needs to do the, its networking part. So we use a technology or an overlay called GRE. So what we do is we set up GRE tunnels between these, uh, between these hypervisor hosts. And then every time a, an Ethernet frame comes out of this VM, we take that Ethernet frame and put it into this GRE packet, and then make sure that GRE packet reaches the, the destination VM because we know where the destination VM is. At the destination, that GRE packet is taken and the Ethernet frame is removed and then put it into this destination VM. So we, and then, so that each VM can talk to each other, we create a full mesh of these GRE tunnels. So there you go, laser beam shooting up again. And uh, this OVS thing I show you is, is called the, uh, the Open V switch controller, uh, also the Open V switch. And that's a piece of technology, it's a hypervisor uh, virtual switch, which is there in, in Zen server and KVM. And, and what the SDN controller does is actually just um, SSHs into the um, into the uh, into the hypervisor to make calls into this OVS um, virtual switch. So so now we have this full mesh of GRE tunnels. Uh, what do we do with it? So GRE has this uh, attribute called a, a GRE key, which uh, which is 32 bits long. And so we allocate a key to one of these uh, networks so that, um, uh, so that each, each network is able to see the, the packets on that, in that, in, in that uh, uh, tagged with that key. And then if you have a, a new network or a new tenant coming in, uh, we just allocate a different set of keys uh, for that tenant. And so they're able to share any GRE tunnels which are already been set up, and they're differentiated with these uh, GRE keys. Are all these communicating in layer two in a VLAN? E Is the GRE the over 
Yeah, it's GRE over IP. So um, this can be one, one end of the data center. That can be a different end of the data center. And all we are assuming is L3 connectivity between those. Also, is it L3? Right, yeah. So um, what makes this um, cloud stack native controller different from any of the other guys, the, the, uh, the billion dollar startups and the um, and this, uh, bunch of other uh, claims out there. Uh, first thing is it was purpose built for the application at hand. It's, it's, it's purpose built for an IAS uh, scenario. And specifically it was purpose built to imitate how um, the Amazon VPC uh, experience was built. So it's not a general purpose SDN solution where you can say that, oh, I can just take out the bits from Cloud Stack and start running a general purpose SDN controller. It's not that. It is built for uh, Cloud Stack. The second differentiator is that it has a proactive model. So by default, when a virtual machine is on the network, it will deny it's, it's all its flows are denied until the user comes in and programs a flow saying that, you know, I want to allow this VM to talk to that VM. At which point we will program a rule saying that, oh, let this packet go through. What the other SDN controllers do is that they have the same set of rules, but as the packet gets out of the VM, they say, well, I don't know what to do with this. So they send it up to the central controller, and they've got this huge central controller which all the flows uh, billions of flows coming in every every day, and they're looking up frantically, looking them up, and trying to figure out well, should we allow this packet or not? So they decide well, let's allow this packet. Then they send down another message back to the uh, uh, to the to the to the hypervisor saying, okay, let the packet through. So it's a, it's it's perfectly valid approach, but it has problems with scaling, and so with a proactive approach. It, it tends to work a little better, or it, 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 you can see it working for you know tens of thousands of machines or tens of thousands of hypervisors. And then, and then finally, it's part of Cloud Stack. It's part of an ESF project. And to uh, provide the uh, layer three to layer seven services, today it uses the virtual router. And that's primarily because uh, if you try to use a, a traditional hardware device like a Juniper SRX or a net scale or load balance, so they don't understand GRE, right? So, so you need some, something else to decapsulate that GRE to an Ethernet frame. And that, you could do that, but that's expensive. So, so today it only works with the virtual route. But that could change. For instance, um, because you have so much control of uh, how a packet can go from A to B, uh, if you want to send a packet from uh, one subnet to another, uh, you could send it directly without sending it to the virtual router. And let me explain that a little bit. Here. Yeah, right here. So imagine this uh, this three-tier network where you have um, instead of VLANs. You got different GRE keys uh, to handle that, uh, to handle that kind of isolation. Now, if the web VM wants to talk to the app VM, you could say that well, he has to go through the virtual appliance, which is another uh, virtual machine. Or you could say that well, I know that he wants to talk to the app VM, so instead of bothering to send it through the virtual appliance, I can set up a tunnel from here to there directly, and then just deliver the packet. In that tunnel, does that go to layer? Uh, layer three. Yeah. yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, instead of using the VLANs, I would just use the GRE key. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, right. right. That's where I was trying to get. Yeah, the yeah, message. yeah. So I could just use the GRE key there, and then set up a brand new tunnel between these two uh, hypervisors, and then you know just bypass the virtual router entirely, right? So it gives you that kind of um, scale because the virtual router is no longer a bottleneck; it's just direct hypervisor to hypervisor communications. So this allows you to orchestrate Yeah, exactly. So, so just to put this in context in my own brain, maybe it'll help others. So I just upgraded my, I, I have a 
you know, they said bring your own device. I brought my own cloud over. <laughs> I, I literally did. I, I have a, you know, just a, a simple. Uh, anyway, I, I just, I just use uh, uh, a clear device hooked into a Cradle Point router, and then I have a, a Cisco VPN, you know, the bottom line, mm -hmm. uh, Cisco VPN router, and I connect my U.S. West zone here in Portland to my U.S. East zone of my client in Minneapolis, and, and I have my own little Cloud, yeah. sandbox yeah. to spin up VMs and, you know. But, the, so, I just recently upgraded it from 4.0 to 4.1, and I, I, I'm literally building Cloud Oh, Center, okay. And then I have my own Debian repository, and so I can, anyway, but the point is, I upgraded it to, to, to pull in these new features, and suddenly I see Okay, I'm familiar with the virtual router. All of a sudden, I see this thing that's the VPC. Yeah, yeah. That's what you're talking about. This is the VPC. Okay, yeah. I just haven't, yeah. haven't yeah. played with it yet. Thank you. What, what's the hypervisor overhead for effectively becoming the router and having to route, route traffic through these various tunnels? Because you're essentially going to have, you could have n number of tunnels for. Uh, for yeah, so a, tunnel, for a tunnel is really. Is, don't think of it like a TCP connection where you're maintaining state. It is just an entry in the database. It just says that, um, oh, this packet's coming in. Well, where's the destination IP address? And then it just forms the, the, the GRE header and sends it out. It's just, so it's only, it's only thinking of that when it sees the key. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's a very good optimization which we need to do. Otherwise, because then it get, lets you, uh, those three subnets I was showing you, it lets you go um, from data center to data center, for instance, right? If what otherwise, do you do about collisions? pardon me. What do you do about collisions in the namespace? Uh, well, it's 32 bits, so we manage uh, like you know four billion networks. Is yeah, we said that about IPv4 too. <laughs> but we're assuming that this is like within our data center, so maybe a million VMs. Should do. So that's awesome. That means that I can sandbox some things, get a development team looking at some new technologies, and have create a VPC from across my US West and US East zone. Not yet, but yeah. No, but that's where it's going. Yeah. Which is really wonderful because that means when I'm, you know, I want to work every other week in a different location. So when I'm here in Portland, I want to, you know, yeah. be working on the VMs that are local to me. But I want to still be able to access them right after I get off the plane, you know. Yeah. So that that's that's great. That's interesting. Uh, so uh, blah, blah. the laser beams. Sure. I did. Yeah. You, you build the mesh between between all the the OBSs and the, and the host. Yeah. So I mean, it's not a it's not a permanent TCP connection between everybody. But if you list the ports on the OBS, <coughs> you're gonna see all those tunnels. Yes, uh, but it's but for any given pair of hypervisors, there's only one tunnel, right? And the the GRE key inside the tunnel is what differentiates the networks. But if you have a full mesh, you could get like a million hosts. Not necessarily. That's assuming a million hosts. That this VM is trying to or the, the hypervisor the VMs on this hypervisor are talking to oh, yes, VMs on a million different other hypervisors. Yeah. So these these tunnels are created on demand. Only when you need them, we create them. So yeah, and some of the future things that we're looking at is um, you know, full a uh, VPC semantics like security groups and, and ACLs, which are not there on the, on the tunnel implementation. Uh, we can optimize uh, ARP and DHCP responses. So what, what I mean by that is today if uh, VM1 sends out uh, an ARP, we have to do some complicated programming on each of the hosts so that uh, because when it's a full mesh, you don't want Pack the broadcast packet to come in and get repeated, and create a you know create a flood. So we have to do some complicated um, uh, programming on these uh, on this uh, OVS tunnel uh, OVS, which is 
Instead, you could run an ARP daemon locally on each of these hosts because we know CloudStack knows the mapping between IP and, Ma and MAC address. So it can a priori program these entries in there and avoid that whole uh, broadcast dilemma. And then uh, same thing with DHCP, when you want to uh, um, get an IP address, that broadcast reaches the virtual router, but you can prevent that by running a uh, DHCP server on each, uh, on each hypervisor. So that was the optimization, and I think that was the end of my presentation. Yeah, and then the, sorry, the cross-zone networks, which I was talking about, which allows us to optimize inter-subnet routing. Okay, uh, that was my presentation. Any questions? Where can I find out more about this? More about, sorry? <laughs> yeah, there's a wiki page. Yeah, there's a lot of good everything. I learned enough to build my own cloud just from everything on the site. It's, it's pretty rich, actually. Yeah. It's quite rich. Can we forge you on that? <laughs> did, you, did you have any problems finding things, or did you need an explicit introduction to start here? Uh, okay, the experience. So my experience was... Um, at first, the learning curve was seemed steep, but I think it was just my realization that I was maybe getting confused coming literally in from Google because there were a lot of older pages that Google would pop up that were from the yeah. site. Yeah. But once I got that sorted out in my head that I wanted to look exclusively at the Apache yeah. wiki site, then that you know then then I honed right in on things. And then the other part was following the the mailing lists for both dev and for user, user. For cloud stack and, and and literally going day by day and checking on new things that were coming out. But I, you know, I, I'm building a bleeding edge one. I'm, I'm literally doing the, the snapshots the night they build, building my own cloud stack, creating Debian modules. There's about 14 of them, putting them in a, in a Debian, Debian package manager, you know, repository that I run locally and then updating my cloud stack, cloud controller from that. So, But I found all that just through looking at the sites and getting my way around. Yeah. There you go, Jessica. Jessica's our docs person. Oh. Or she's the I, primary I, documentation contributor. I see based on the name, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I also knew Jessica before I saw her. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So that was a trick question, I think. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theory of cloud here and theory of what, uh, I, I guess when we expect people to land on the cloud stack page, they know something yeah. already. So you've got a slide deck, the one from Lisa, that goes pretty step by step. Yes, it does. So yeah. you may check his slide share. He, uh, he ran along for about three hours about next generation networking. Uh, and, and I'm being quite serious, it, it was a three hour tutorial, so um, that slide deck may be useful. Why don't we use STT? Yeah. Um, STT today requires a, um, I think a proprietary uh, plugin from um, Micera. Uh, OBS. Yes, for OBS, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure they intend to contribute it, but I'm not sure when. Sure. Uh, about the future from the plugin, uh, sorry, the Michelin movie. Uh, is there a plan to support the graphical user interface so for the end user interface? Because uh, all of them have no support of the graphical user interface, and we have a lot of trouble for people from that. So it's in, isn't the graphical user interface in 4.1? Um, I mean, for uh, 4.0, all you do is when you create the um, 
network offering, you just choose STT in the, as the isolation technology, and that's all there is to it. Uh, and that should be in 4.0. For 4.1, again, there's nothing nicer or specific except from the admin. Yeah. I, I thought that uh, when you wrote the L3 yes. zero stuff for four one that that four two that, I think oh is it four two yeah probably it hit four one okay because several months ago that four four dot one several points to be to be supported I by you mentioned in the slide yeah four dot one might be skipped yeah I think it might be four dot two yeah yeah I'll I'll look yeah. Okay, thank you.